Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural lecture of Professor Katie Laird. I feel personally very honoured to be in the chair today uh, because Professor Laird is such an asset to our university. Um, Katie joined our university in 2009 and she is a professor of microbiology in the School of Pharmacy and also the head of the Infectious Disease Research Group here at De Montfort University. She also has a BSc Honours in Biology and she obtained a PhD in Applied Microbiology in 2008. Her research is centred on the prevention of transmission of healthcare acquired infections, including the development of novel antimicrobials. Sorry if I've said that wrong, Katie. Um, a particular focus of um, Professor Laird's research is on the role of healthcare textiles as formites. And recently her research emphasis has been on the potential transmission of coronavirus via textiles. Um, her research has helped protect laundry and healthcare workers around the world. She and her team found that domestic washing machines were often running at temperatures too low to kill bacteria, and as a result, clothing could be passing on germs. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, Professor Laird's team found that coronavirus was able to remain on clothes and potentially transmit to other surfaces for up to three days findings that were widely reported in the media around the world. And earlier this year, I had the great honour of being involved with Professor Laird and her colleague, Dr. Maitre, um, working with the British Footwear Association on a study that helped the association members understand the way coronavirus behaves on leather. Thanks to their work, they were able to develop findings that will enable shoe companies keep their surfs, the staff safe and to improve their processes and later today she's actually taking part in a global women, webinar on that topic presenting the research findings to the shoe manufacturers around the world. Katie Laird's other major passion is a germs journey. She describes that everyone has a passion project and this is one that has really impacted on the lives of so many children around the world. Professor Laird and Professor Sarah Uni launched a germs journey to teach young children the importance of hand washing and good hygiene through a fun book and website. The site has been accessed in 117 countries and the resources have been adapted for use in India and Sierra Leone and, and have now reached more than 145,000 individuals and improved healthcare outcomes for those children around the world. And they have just announced plans to take that further and teach children about respiratory viruses in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic with funding from companies including Barclays Bank and Dettol. And so now from a germs journey, we're gonna take you to Katie's journey as she shares with us how working with industry has informed her research and also delivered real impact around the world. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Katie Laird. Thank you, Helen, for that introduction. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to talk to you about my journey, as Helen said, um, to, to my chair and how that's been achieved through enterprise research, really, and knowledge exchange and the impact that that has had on society. So DMU now has a new career pathway in knowledge exchange and um, professional practice. And I think for individuals like myself, where our research is very applied or very practice based, this gives everybody the opportunity to be able to develop um, and advance in their career in this direction. And it's well recognized now that knowledge exchange, enterprise, professional practice has impact on society and uh, particularly through the knowledge exchange framework that the university is evaluated on. And a message that I suppose I really want to get across throughout this presentation is, 
if your research is that that lends itself to industry, to um, social impact, the core at the core of that is the underpinning research. This whole journey for me and for others, I'm hoping that will come through the this this pathway, is the research good solid research must be there in order to underpin the activities you're doing in the the wider community so the types of projects over the years that i've been involved in include ktps this was very much around product development for a particular sector so um, we were looking at a cosmetic sector for this and the development of a, a facial toner that treated acne. Uh, I do an awful lot of contract research, consultancy type research. Um, most of this is product development or um, microbial efficacy testing. So we either work with a company to improve their products, to repurpose their products, or on occasions to start from scratch. But very often a company will say, I have, a certain technology we think does this, we're going to send it off to get some biocide regulations in place or to get an ISO um, stamp on it to say that, yes, it definitely does this. Can you look at it first and assess, are we meeting the criteria or do we need to, to tweak some, um, some things about the technology? And a lot of the contract research that we have come in through the university is this type of, of research. And um, as Helen has mentioned, one of my passions is Germ's Journey. And this is much more a charitable project, but we gain a lot of funding, partnerships, promotion, marketing, networking through sponsorship. And this is mainly through corporate sponsorship. So I'm also going to talk a little bit more about that as well. So this slide just demonstrates the companies that I have worked with, and there is there is more um, over the years. And I'm going to just pull out a few and the types of work that we do do with them. So um, if we take, we've got the trade bodies for the textile industry here. So we have the TSA, which is the UK trade body, the TRSA, which is the American equivalent, and ETSA, which is the European equivalent. I found um, through the years that actually working with trade bodies is a fantastic way of disseminating knowledge but also being at the cutting edge of what the industry needs. And much of my research is around healthcare textiles. And in 2014, I'm going to say, I started looking at the survival of microbes on textiles, some bacteria and spores. And we've looked at it in a number of settings. So we looked at it in the domestic setting because in the UK, healthcare uniforms such as nurses' uniforms are laundered at home and then taken back into the domestic setting for laundering. So we assessed that. We also assessed the flip side of that, the industrial laundering um, side for healthcare textiles. And these would be things like bed sheets of patients' beds and um, scrubs. And we looked at the survival of spores from C. difficile patients. So we're directly from patients through the industrial laundering services. And we worked alongside these global associations to establish be best practice. And then in recent years, they've funded or commissioned me to develop a test standard that can be used internationally to assess the efficacy of the um, healthcare laundry in the industrial sector, as well as looking at care home um, laundering and how this can be improved. Now, the reach from this, because I'm doing the research through the trade bodies, is enormous. It reaches on the ground care homes and hospitals, as well as the entire industries. We're talking about the detergent companies, the textile manufacturers, the, the laundries themselves. And 
as a dissemination route, they are very open to academic publishing as well as the sort of professional publications and media stories. So in terms of reach and knowledge exchange, this has been very fruitful over the years. I've also worked with companies like Microfresh is on here where we've repurposed products. So we've taken their silver coating for textile technology and we've looked at how that can be used within um, actual domestic washing as a supplement, as an antimicrobial. We've worked with Pow International on looking at wipes and their efficacy. Trelleborg, again, is mattress material um, used within hospitals. You can see um, Penny Price Aromatherapy on here. This, again, was product development. It was that cosmetic product that we talked about for acne. And the recently, um, alongside um, Dr. Maitre Shivkumar, who's a virologist at DMU, who developed a model for SARS-CoV-2 um, that we could use to assess the survival of coronavirus, we took that model and we used it within um, our textile research and we demonstrated how long coronavirus could last in laundries. Now this, um, on textiles and in the wash process, sorry, and this had significant impact because at the time, the industry didn't know what was the best program for laundering. They were looking at raising temperatures, Nobody really had any information. And based on our findings, it meant that the temperature of these industrial healthcare wash cycles didn't have to be increased. And thereby, we saved the industry £1.5 million in the UK, but also they were able to process linen safely. And off, um, subsequent to that, that also meant that there was um, environmental impacts because high temperature washing has a significant impact on the environment and we were able for that not to happen. At the same time, we've got the British Climbing Walls Association there. And this was a bit of a strange one when they approached us because it was completely outside of what we would um, normally um, be looking at as in textiles. But they wanted to understand if chalk could carry the coronavirus because they were worried about climbing walls open again and the chalk powder and the spreading of the virus. Um, we found out that the chalk quite readily desiccated the virus, um, but it was it was a slightly um, strange challenge to say the least. My tray and I um, it was an interesting project, and this was basically all of the links for many of these companies come through networking because they had links with the Textile Services Association and this is how that research came about. And we've also got on there the British Footwear Association. We looked at how leather could carry the coronavirus and how that potentially transfer to other surfaces within the manufacturing lines because they're quite heavy on um, intensive manpower and producing shoes. But what did that also mean for retail where everyone's trying shoes, is, shoes on and then another person's coming in? So it was very dependent on the type of leather for how long the um, virus survived. But it, in those non-absorbent leathers, those highly waxed or patent leathers, it was able to transfer to um, both stainless steel and cardboard. Um, however, using some technologies that we were aware of, we were able to put antimicrobials onto leather and reduce that from survival of 24 hours down to two hours, which was, was good news for the industry. And as Helen mentioned, we're, we're presenting that this evening to a global um, footwear audience. So that really gives you a taste of the type of work we do, the number of industries that we work with. Uh, and what I've really spoken about there is KTP's contract research. But the other way in which we get industry sponsorship is through the Germs Journey product, project. And that absolutely relies on sponsorship from corporate entities. So you can see on here Barclays, Detail, Suez, Surewash, Next, 
um, and some others. These have all sponsored a GEMS journey. And much of that sponsorship has come either through dissemination, where we, the university or through um, press releases, they've heard about the project, or it's direct networking and relationships with, with the corporate sponsors. For instance, Next had a challenge um, and they had links with Microfresh who got put in touch with us. We helped them. It was only a very small thing they needed to do. So we we basically did that bit of work for them. And um, off the back of that, they sponsored Germ's Journey. So one piece of advice I would give to people who are looking to go down this career route is the networks and the relationships um, when working with our industry are quite critical. So a Germ's Journey then, um, this project... Um, my co is alongside my co-founder, Professor Sarah Uni, who's an educationalist, and I'm a microbiologist. So the synergy there in order to drive educational resources for young children on hand washing forward um, is, is, a, is a good synergy. And we have developed a whole range of resources that are free at the point of access for children around the world. And we co-create, which means we work with people on the ground to understand what it is that they would like from the resources to enable children to learn. Because in different cultural settings, in different countries, the, the need of the educational need can be quite different and how that presented is also different. So I've put, you can see our website as the background there, and we have ages three to six, seven to 11, and then we've called it the grown up section, which is where the teacher healthcare worker resources are. So we've developed books that have been sponsored for children in the UK, India, and Sierra Leone. And um, more recently, we've had companies, particularly when the pandemic hit, approach us about how we could work with them to develop resources that were also free at the point of um, access and independent. So you can see here the superheroes, um, which is basically aimed at paediatric wards and is um, sponsored by POW International. They also funded the development of the website. And we have clinical trial, ethical approval to go into hospitals and give children a fun pack with our superheroes and um, they'll get washing products like gel and soap and lots of games and puzzles and the intervention is to look at if children on paediatric wards both long stay and short stay if they interact with washing their hands more readily if it's just a product that's there or if they have this educational practice package around it um, and it's been delayed a few times due to COVID but we we are planning on getting into the hospitals in February so watch this space with that one. Um, on the left hand side you can see um, a little avatar of a very brightly coloured um, well boy um, and the logo there. We're working alongside um, Surewash who um, create um, hand washing training technology for nurses. It's basically a screen off of a tablet that you wash your hands under and it tells you how well you've washed your hands as in have you met all the points or touched all the points you're meant to on the hands. And we were approached by Surewash to develop one for children in schools and we've been working over the last um, year to 18 months really developing the app and it's due to be released um, just before Christmas. And we have um, the little avatar you can see alongside games and quizzes, um, all centered around Germ's journey that's connected to the hand washing um, behavior technology. So children in schools can use it to improve their hand washing technique, which um, is great news because particularly in the UK, children tend to do something I call tickle fingers, which is where they just tickle their fingers under the water and don't necessarily wash them um, properly. So that's some of the observations we've had with all the children we worked with. And in the bottom hand corner, you can see a germ's journey of fight res for resistance. 
This is a book that's aimed at um, key stage two, so that's sort of eight to 11 year olds, and is about um, antimicrobial resistance. The book has just been published and there's an ebook version coming out. And I'm working alongside um, a lecturer, um, hospital pharmacist, um, Ryan Hamilton, um, to develop workshops alongside our very talented PhD students um, that are centered around this book. And this book was particularly developed so that children have to make decisions within the story around um, antibiotic resistance. And all of this has only been possible through that networking and sponsorship that we've had um, from companies. So in terms of reach then, we've now actually, I would say we're um, over the 150,000 people or individuals that we've reached and most probably near 16,000 children, um, as well as over 300 teachers. Um, we're actually, because we've just had the AMR books and we've recently done a book for those living with dementia. So we're at 5,000 books to three countries across three continents. Um, which is significant reach with this project. And what we've done alongside that in terms of the impact is um, we've increased children's understanding of germs and germs transfer um, up to 40%. And this increased knowledge, and we're talking about young children here, three to five year olds, this increased knowledge um, lasts in 30% of those children for at least up to a month afterwards, which is fantastic. And two months are in India, two months after doing these studies in um, slum areas within India, 60 to 73% roughly um, understood what germs were and why they were causing illness and up to 80% knew how to remove them from their hands. And considering... Um, the language and education, because the education, the reading standard was very low, um, achieving these um, increases in knowledge was significant for us. And we did a lot of that through using images and pictures. And um, a year and a half after putting the culturally relevant books into schools, um, across Amabad. So I think 5,000 children in total were using those books. The teachers reported 100% um, that they'd seen some um, health benefits and um, that were associated with hand washing and reduced illness. So this was a fantastic result. We did a big study alongside DMU's psychology team um, and we looked at hand washing behaviour and how this could be increased. So again, this is the points in the hands that we developed. The app form be out soon. Um, but by using song videos, and we looked at that in schools, but also in public arenas, because Germs Journey has a permanent exhibition in the toilets, actually, in the Think Tank Museum in Birmingham. So there's a magic mirror and you press a button and the song that we developed with the think tank and the children from a local school pops up and it tells you um, how to wash your hands. And this is only a few minute intervention, um, but what we found was 53% um, of children were washing between their fingers more than they had done before. Um, so raised from about 25% to 53%, so about 25% increase. And um, when we went back to the schools after a month, again, there was an increase in um, behave, hand washing behaviour that was maintained. And that was particularly in areas around the wrist and under the nails, which children didn't necessarily or weren't thinking about at the time. And we finished this behaviour study a matter of weeks before we, the first lockdown in March 2020. So it was very topical. Um, and illness here, as I said, the um, in Amabad, the, um, they were reporting a decrease in illness. And we've had similar reports coming out of Sierra Leone. And Sierra Leone are also looking to incorporate um, a germs journey into the education curriculum. So 
what do I believe, I suppose, made some of this network in the industry work, the sponsorship, the knowledge exchange and successful? For me, before we started um, promoting widely the commercial work we could do and Germ's Journey, it was about branding. It was about making us consistent, having a clear message of what we could offer and how we could offer it. And so branding was really important, both for the infectious disease research group, but also for Germ's Journey. And we worked with marketing teams on both. It was internal marketing for um, the infectious disease research group, and it was external marketing um, for a Germ's Journey. But once that was branded and we had a recognizable product, if you like, and it was understood exactly um, what it was we could offer, it was then about dissemination to the wider public or to industry. And I'm chair of the MediLink um, Infectious Disease um, Special Interest Group. And so twice a year, I run conferences out of MediLink. And it's a forum for industry and academia to come together and discuss um, topics, issues, solutions um, around particular areas of infectious disease. And this has been invaluable in the networking and um, I suppose visually what um, we are and being out there. So we're not just at the university working away in our labs. We're, we're out in the public domain offering our advice readily um, and solutions and people understand who we are and what what we can we can offer and the other thing that I do a lot of and it has very good benefits it sometimes has a few drawbacks is we work very closely with the marketing team at DMU the media team and um, we do a lot of public um, releases of stories into the media in to promote what we're doing basically the science that we're doing and how this has impact on society and what this means in real life so over the years i've had a page page three full page three in the times on the um textiles research the work that Maitre and i did on the um, coronavirus on textiles that went global. It was all over the world in the media and Marcoms at the university have said that we reach 2 billion individuals with that story, which was really important. We also publish in trade, healthcare, um, media magazines, trade magazines and publications so that our research, if it's relevant to a particular industry, is out there. So one example is um, the Merce Nursing Times, We've done some in the laundry industry magazines. Um, and it's really about getting the message out there so people can use um, can use the um, information readily and that dissemination. But on the back side of that, what you have is people, more people know what you do, so more people approach you about working on projects. Um, so, so it's a bit of a snowball effect, really. Um, and I think I've got here one of my favourite headlines that come out of some of those media stories. Um, so I think I've, over the years of doing this, I think that's my uh, one of my favourite headlines that come out. So from an academic point of view, then, what are the benefits, really, of doing this type of work? Um, and I've put some here. So internal income generation, um, it's generated over £500,000 worth of income um, to 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 both projects really that's external income we've developed products that are retailing so we can see our products on the shelf and this has impact significant impact as i said at the beginning and i want to reiterate the work all has to be underpinned by good solid research and so papers and conferences um come from the work with with industry and before we start a project we very clearly state what we'd like to publish if it's publishable what agreements have to be in place this is already agreed before we start the work um 
I've had invited speaker opportunities. That's both for academic and industry conferences. Germ's journeys led to an impact case study in REF 2020. And both the industry work and the Germ's journey work is um, we already have evidence and um, papers, et cetera, for impact case studies for them. Develop significant global networks um, within the trades we work within, so within the textile trade, within the infectious disease arena, um, which are, are really useful in driving forward research. And we have got our research findings out into the public domain so they can be of use to individuals, to industry, etc. So my final thoughts um, before we move on to a bit of a discussion. So this is a two part um, lecture where there's obviously me talking and then a discussion around some of the topics that that I've spoken about. What do I believe are, are the things that enable people to drive forward with this knowledge exchange enterprise practice pathway? Um, I think good communication with the business development managers um, and the HLS um, enterprise team are really important. They need to know what you're doing, how they can promote it, how they can help you drive that forward with from an industry perspective. And for me, to particularly the relationship with Marcom, so the, the media team um, at DMU, because working alongside them, I've been able to develop some some research into phrasing and wording that the lay public understand our industry understand and can move that forward so putting that in terms that are relevant to the individuals and promoting the research globally i think when you're working with industry we need to ensure that the contracts that we put in place are very clear on all the roles for the party for both industry and for the academic, because sometimes they're very industry driven, which is fine because they're funding the project. But at the end of that, the academic needs to feel that they've also moved on um, their research career. So the, the contracts need to work for the academic as much as they do for the industry, um, the industry partners. And something I specifically do within my contracts is build in impact questionnaires so that I monitor the impact that my research has had on that company, the wider industry, um, and that we're able to get feedback for five years post the project, which I think is really important. But for me, I enjoy working at the cutting edge of industry and enterprise while also achieving those academic outcomes. Um, and it's I'm, it's a good, for me, it's a very good position to be in. Um, yeah, so, so I'm able to fulfill that sort of industry come academic role. And um, we're now going to invite Helen back to have a bit of discussion around what I've just presented on. Thank you, Katie. Uh, it's fascinating to hear about your work. And um, I think I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning and what my relationship is with your work. So I'm the um, Director of Enterprise and Business Services. So we've been very honored to work with Katie and uh, particularly her team, um, Katie and Maitre, uh, because the industry relationships that you develop are, are so important in this area and so important for the university. And I think one of the things that you'd said um, during your presentation was the fact that actually the work that you're doing has led you to impact case studies and then uh, for REF 2020. But equally, those um, those projects can um, be featured in the environment statement. So I think it's really important that um, researchers understand that working in the enterprise arena also gives them that opportunity to have that um, input into the REF as well. So we've got three questions that have been submitted already, but I would like to encourage the audience to put their questions into the chat while we go through um, these questions uh, because 
Katie really wants to encourage you to, to ask these questions, but equally to use this as a learning opportunity for yourselves, because I, I know that for a lot of people, they, um, they worry about actually where does enterprise uh, begin? Where does um, impact on knowledge exchange begin? And where does research begin? And where does, how do the two marry together? So we, at the beginning, we, we kind of um, skipped through the fact that you had a, a, a career in industry and you were working as a fabric technologist at Aquascutum. Um, and one of the questions that came in was, how did you make that um, change from working in industry into, into being a researcher? And what were the benefits for you of having been in industry? Um, I, when I was working in industry, I was in the lab, so it was still quite science-based. Um, and it was a very much quality control role. So looking at procedures, testing um, the efficacy, it was of textiles and their relevance to the particular garments they were going into. We also worked alongside the designers in London, um, whereby they'd say, right, this is what we've designed. This is the textile we want to use. And if they'd chosen something very thin, like a silk, for trousers that was going to abrade away within two hours um we'd say no stop you know we need to change the product here slightly you know the design was always lovely but the textile just needed to be changed a wee bit and um we also then um developed the care labels for the products so we'd have to look at how they can be washed etc and for me i really enjoyed the the switch between that design product development and the functionality um, because something can look very nice but not work and and that process however I, I hadn't I hadn't studied microbiology at all at this point and I'd only um, done textiles I wanted more independence in um, the research that I was doing and looking at products I, I suppose for developing my own products um, and I had a particular interest in science um, and it was biology at the time rather than microbiology. So I just decided to go and do a degree in it. I don't think there was any major thought process in it at the time. Um, and, and then it developed into microbiology and I worked, my um, PhD was very much in product development. We were developing a vapor to cleanse the air using natural products. And then when I started at DMU and found out they had a textile department, well, I was just in my element at that point because I had the textiles and I had the microbiology. But I must say this wasn't a quick process and it took many years to build the research up, to build the relationships. And um, I've had two career breaks with two children as well. So I've interrupted a few times. Um, but I think... For me, it's that passion that drives you. And I just I just thoroughly enjoy working with industry, product development, efficacy testing. And I think that that's what that's what's driven it really. Okay. Um, so the next question is um, what do you think is the biggest challenge of working with industry? I think the biggest challenge is managing expectations. Um, because industry works very differently to how academia works. And I think having worked in that quality control role in industry before, I, I have some idea of what they're expecting against what you can achieve with research generally and in an academic institution. So I think that time period and when you're designing the project, you're talking about the contracts, you're talking about timescales, I really believe it's that management of the expectations mm -hmm. and then understanding that research takes time, that the results sometimes are negative and not going to be what they want, even though they've given you tens of thousands of pounds to do this research. And that we're not just here to give them a rubber stamp on their product, but they get the extra value from the university. So they get that development of the product 
a little bit if that's what's in the contract and even if it isn't we usually do it they get the business development they get the 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 communications the media the marcoms all of that as an added value and i think if you work closely with whoever you're working with up front to develop the relationship and give them an understanding of what they expect and what's expected of you back from them I think you can you can manage those expectations and those challenges from the get go rather than them becoming an issue part way through. Yeah. So 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 I think what you're saying is make sure that you've thought that through at the beginning and have those clear conversations and clear requirements for yourself. Yeah. Um, and I think I think as well, it's building in the added value that working with the university above just a test house as such um, can give them. And it's building on that rhetoric, I think, that really helps. Yeah. And you mentioned Medilink and uh, how Medilink gives you access to those networks. And I think it's just worth reminding um, the viewers today that actually... Uh, the university does have relationships with a lot of these uh, business membership organizations and please approach your business development manager in the faculty or one of my team if you're looking for some sort of network opportunity to to find yourself those relationships because i think as you mentioned relationships actually can take quite some time to build up they do. And I think if we look at the TSA, the Textile Services Association, I was knocking on their door slightly tenaciously um, for about four years before they funded a major project. And it was it was just reminding them that I was still here and I'd done a bit of research and this was helpful for them. And could I help them with anything? And And over time, that relationship now becomes one where it's just a two way conversation. Um, and I think that's really important in building up those networks. And many successful researchers that you talk to that do the type of work, that industry, enterprise practice type of work, it's it's about relationships. Yeah. And interestingly, I remember um, with the British Footwear Association, actually, that was quite quick, wasn't it? Because they mm. approached um, you very and very quickly that, that research um, took place. So I, I guess there's, I guess there's scales. Sometimes it takes a long time, but sometimes when there's an urgent need, it can be quite quick. And I think that was the thing with the British Footwear Association. There was an urgent need. There was coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there was a, they, they needed to know yesterday. So I think in those cases where you've built your reputation and people know that you can do this type of work that's where the quick rate the quick relationships come in because they're relying on your reputation from others um that, that you'll be able to produce the work that they need in order to help their industry yeah which underpins what you were saying about having that close relationship with uh the marketing communications department and making sure that you're sending out press releases about your work and I think the other thing that I that I note that you do really well is that um, making sure that you create speaking opportunities and you invite the industry partner to do that with you when you can. And that is certainly a metric that universities are now being measured on. And the, the I think the really interesting thing about that is the more of that you do, the actual more income is generated through the HIFE fund, which is the Higher Education Innovation Fund, which then can go back into your projects and back into your research. Mm. No, I agree. And uh, that's that's really helped. The HIFE fund particularly has really helped promote, well, not promote, but enabled us to do some of the research that we needed to do to help industry. And I think it's showing the, the pathway between the research you're doing the industry and then what the impact on that industry is and it's being able to very clearly map that out and at the beginning of projects when i start speaking to companies whether they're sponsors for germ's journey whether it's industry contract i'm automatically thinking right what's the end goal what are the wider goals of the company here is there for instance environmental impact is there um 
socioeconomic impact. So it isn't just about that company increasing their income or putting a new product out in the market. Beyond that, what can we do that can it can help other areas? And usually if you speak to the company about say, look, I don't mind you making money off this and that's what you're paying me for, but can we use this to help in this school? Or Shorewash, for instance, can we take your app and give free licenses out in India and Sierra Leone? And, and usually it's a yes. So although they've developed a product, we've also managed to help children in low income countries to have access to it free of charge as well. And so I do find that that within relation as you build the relationships, there are such added value that you can gain through commercial partners that you maybe wouldn't through other academic partners. Yeah. Okay. And you also mentioned um in your um in your talk about accessible language and accessible language for the for industry and the business community and also for the for the charity um community can you tell us a little bit more about kind of how does how did you how did you approach that what because it's, sometimes it's really hard to break it down isn't it mm. your your research to actually make it um understand understandable to a mass audience um well two things for me um i'm a medici fellow out of birmingham university which dmu put me through their course and you go off for block week trainings across a just over a year period and they teach you all about enterprise industry but also dissemination um and they do track media training um and so how you'd speak and or how you pitch i suppose it's pitch how you pitch your projects and in addition I was a media fellow for DMU not long after I first started um, because at my previous university, I used to work um, with television. So I used to work on um, How Clean's Your House is one of the big ones I worked on. And we used to write the science script and do the um, agar plates and show what germs were in these horrible houses. And then we used to have to go out and film alongside um, Kim and Aggie and we used to say to them no put it in these terms don't do this term and and so I had some experience from doing that previously with working with television um, I'd had the Medici um, training and then I become a media um, fellow at DMU when that scheme was in many years ago and I spent a lot of time with the media team then and they taught you things and there was training as well so my background, I'd already done quite a bit of this type of work. Um, but it it's really, I think it's it's understanding what your, I mean, you really have to understand your science to be able to put it into lay terms, I think. Um, and it's about understanding what re people relate to, I think, in your story. Um, and very often some of the stuff I've done around healthcare textiles, it was about the nurses domestically laundering their uniforms because people can relate to seeing a nurse in Asda um, and um, wearing their uniforms and what the risks are. And it's about bringing those messages out. So I think, I think having some type of media training helps. Um, and... For those that are not sure, our comms team are really good at taking the science and sitting down with you and just listening to you talk about your science and then putting it into what more lay language, I suppose. And then they email you the story and you can work backwards and forwards on that. And that relationship works quite well. Yeah. OK. And I have to say, Katie, I've always found you very supportive of your colleagues um, and I'm sure you wouldn't mind me saying that you are quite keen to support other colleagues in this journey. So um, Katie has uh, worked with my team very extensively and we have agreed that, you know, some training workshops, um, we will start some training workshops for um, research colleagues because I think I think you're right. There's for you when you are working so closely in in a subject area it's actually quite difficult to, to divorce yourself from the detail and actually just highlight um, to, to kind of non-scientists, non but also non-academics, uh, the importance and the opportunity of the research. Mm. No, it is. And I think working closely 
with all the expertise that we have at DMU can, can really enhance what you're trying to do. Okay, um, so the last question we have um, is, what are you most proud of and what excites you the most about your new role? Um, what I'm most proud of is when we, Sarah and I were stood in Ahmabad and it was the third trip. So it was the third year after we'd been developing the resources for out there. And we we always take our students with them and one of them um, could speak Gujarati, hence why we took him actually, part of the reason. <laughs> that was always helpful. And when the teachers told us we're doing a focus group with about 50 teachers and the teachers all turned around and said our your resources have enabled us to teach children and due to that we've seen reduced illness well I was close to tears at this point because you know this was 5,000 children that we and their teachers um, wow. we've had such significant impact on and what they were also saying was the young children were going home and teaching their grandparents their parents all about hand washing so the wider impact of that was most really much greater than what we could record because some of it was unrecordable so I think that moment and that was just before the pandemic hit as well we literally were flying back as it closing everywhere down um that that moment I think was a real highlight for me and I think in my new role as professor that's been promoted through this knowledge exchange pathway I'm excited about encouraging others to follow the same pathway to inspire others to look at their research and see if this is a route that they feel they would like to go down and um, to help play a role maybe in mentoring those people through through this pathway because it would be lovely it would be lovely to see more individuals doing it okay well that's a great note to end on and to say thank you um, for sharing your journey with us but also to say thank you on behalf of all of those who have have really benefited from your research because it is phenomenal what you have achieved and we're so proud to have you as our first professor of enterprise so thank you so much, Katie. And I know on behalf of the audience, uh, we have found it really fascinating um, to hear from you. And um, I wish you well as you progress through, um, this, through this new post. And I'm really looking forward to working with you on some more projects. Thank you. <laughs>